Thank you for joining us today for a surgeon as caregiver, the triple threat of caring for yourself while caring for a loved one, while caring for patients, hosted by the American College of Surgeons Wellbeing Workgroup. I have the pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Carla Hack. Dr. Hack is an assistant professor of general and GI surgery, the medical director for care coordination for Emory University Hospital and Emory University Orthopedic and Spine Hospital, and the Harry B. Trippy Clinical Scholar. Dr. Hack completed her general surgery residency at Emory University, and during her chief residency, she was named a Grady Memorial Hospital Healthcare Hero by the Grady Health Foundation and received the David B. Feliciano Teaching Award. Dr. Hack led the creation of the content for Emory's patient education app, Come Clean, Stop Surgical Infections Before They Start which educates patients on wound care and how to reduce their risk for surgical site infections. Dr. Hack is a faculty member of the Emory Haitian Alliance, which offers medical attention and surgery to patients in the country's central plateau. She serves as a medical volunteer in her homeland of Puerto Rico also. Dr. Hack is a certified yoga instructor and founded the Emory Healthcare Yoga Studio to provide healthcare professionals and their families with resources to enhance their mental health and physical and spiritual wellness. Dr. Hack is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and a member of the ACS Wellbeing Workgroup. I thank you so much, Dr. Hack, for moderating today's webinar. Thank you, Kathleen, so much for that incredibly generous and kind introduction. And thank all of you for being here today. Once again, joining us today for the surgeon as caregiver, a triple threat, caring for yourself while caring for a loved one while caring for your patients. Today, we will explore the challenges that we face when being a caregiver for those in our social support network, as well as everybody else that we take care of. We're joined today by our colleagues, Dr. Red Hoffman and Dr. Rohan Jayaraja, who will share their experiences and their perspectives as surgeons, as caregivers, and as humans doing the best we can with what we've got. They will share lessons they've learned, explore the difference between compassion and empathy, and the influence of being a surgeon as caregiver on a career trajectory in balancing life, work, and everything else that comes our way. Um, we welcome Dr. Hoffman, who practices as an acute care surgeon and associate hospice medical director at Mission Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina. She's one of about 90 surgeons in the United States who is board certified in hospice and palliative medicine. She's an adjunct professor in the Department of Surgery at UNC and serves as surgery clerkship director for UNC School of Medicine Asheville campus. Dr. Hoffman is a co-founder of the Pal of Surgical Palliative Care Society and founder and host of the Surgical Palliative Care podcast. She writes and speaks both nationally and internationally about the integration of palliative medicine and end of life care into the care of surgical patients. She also speaks extensively on the care of surgical patients with opioid use disorder. Dr. Hoffman previously trained and worked as a naturopathic physician and fellow yoga teacher <laughs> and integrates these experiences into her current practice. Dr. Hoffman is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and a member of the ACS Surgeon Wellbeing Work Group and an ACS Committee on Surgical Palliative Care. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman, for being with us today. You have the floor. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. My name's Red, thanks so much for having me today. I just wanted to share briefly about my caregiving experience and then spend some time focusing on some of the lessons I learned. So my caregiving experience started on September 28th, 2020, when my previously healthy 40-year-old partner, Brandon, fell off a ladder at work and suffered a traumatic brain injury. And what was initially thought to be a mild traumatic brain injury really turned into much worse. He spent five weeks in the hospital and rehab and then came home and I was his caregiver. And he was able to do um, the majority of his ADLs, except uh, I didn't trust him in the shower and really not many of his IADLs. And so at the time I was working full-time as a acute care surgeon and it became um, very, it became quickly apparent that I wasn't going to be able to work full-time and care for him anymore and manage his medications and take him to his doctor's appointments and spend all the time I did obsessing about trying to get him well and make sure he got the care that he deserved. And so I went down to 0.85 at work and started doing more administrative work. And then during that time I got COVID and then long COVID. And so at the end we were ended up both being sick and I was on short-term disability. 
And um, seven months and two days after Brandon's accident, after a really particularly painful morning, he went outside and he shot himself. And I heard the gunshot and found him dying. And that kind of began the second part of my experience, which was how to deal with all this um, grief. And so I wanted, you know, I, I think the one benefit I have is hindsight. And so I'm not in the midst of that horrible pain anymore. And I wanted to share a little bit because I think even if your story is not as quote unquote traumatic or dramatic as that, I think we can all agree that being a caregiver while trying to care for yourself, while still practicing in this very stressful field is um, really can be challenging beyond belief. So the first thing is self-care. And I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it, but I think I also think it's important to acknowledge that the reality is when you're doing all of these things, the likelihood of having time for self-care is um, really low. But the one thing I'll say is I, if I could go back, I'd spend a little more time focused on my mental health. I really was struggling in a way that I couldn't even find the words to articulate. I used to tell my mom, I, I wanted someone to extract me from my life. That's how painful it was. And so just what I found, I went into therapy six days after Brandon died and I've been doing internal family systems and I cannot recommend this type of therapy enough. And I think for people who are really smart like us and thoughtful and introspective, it is can be really life-changing. So I wanted, I didn't know anything about it, um, but I just wanted to put it out there. Number two, I think, is the importance of asking for help. Again, something we hear all the time and something I was not very good at. One of the reasons I realized that I didn't want to ask for help is that Brandon was very private and he didn't want anyone else in our house. And I really ended up deferring to him in a way that I didn't defer to him during the vast majority of our relationship. And what I realized was even though he was injured and sick, in the end, I did no one any good by kind of changing the dynamics of the relationship. I should have almost continued to have the relationship that we did and to continue to ask for what I needed, which was help, help, you know, cleaning the house, doing the lawn, simple things. Um, so I just want to put that out there. I think it's easy to defer to our loved ones when they're ill, but I don't know that it necessarily serves the bigger picture. It's just something to think about. Number three is a lesson I learned from my therapist that was, he articulated so well. He works with people who have chronic illness and injury and pain. And he said that he found that his patients are often, their understanding is at the tip of the arrow and all of us are kind of following behind. And when I look back, I saw that with Brandon. I think he saw the writing on the wall. He used to tell me, if I could just get my pain from a 10 to a five, I could live with this headache and this nausea and this dizziness and all his other symptoms for the rest of my life. And when I heard that as a doctor and as the trauma surgeon, it used to drive me crazy. I wanted to fix everything. But I think that he had this intuitive wisdom that like I just could not listen to. And so I would just invite you, if you're caring for someone and they're saying some things, you know, whether it's I'm not wanting to do this treatment anymore or asking for certain things to just maybe step back and listen in a way that I really wasn't able to. I just kept pushing, pushing, pushing until the very end. I wanted him to go to every single doctor and, you know, it was coming from a place of love, but I think it, I don't know if it was serving him in the end. Um, number four is just a little bit about grief. I mean, there's so much grief. I think one is this anticipatory grief. So I'm sure many of you are caring for elderly parents who may be nearing the end. And so there's that sense of it's called anticipatory grief. We know that people are going to die. It's so hard to handle that when you're in the midst of caregiving, working as a surgeon, caring for your family, trying to care for yourself. I think if nothing else, just kind of naming it. Um, then I think there's the grief around watching your loved one suffer. For me, I couldn't process any of that in the, in the mist. It took, I'm still processing it. In fact, more than Brandon's death, I cry more about how much he suffered and how little I was able to help him. Um, and there's a book that I love about grief. It's called, it's okay to not be okay by Megan Devine. And it's one of the best books that in all my reading that I read about grief that kind of really helped articulate some of what I was feeling. I think there's also a lot of grief around how this affects our job. For me, um, not only was my job affected by Brandon, but also by the fact I ended up with long COVID. So now I'm 
relatively new in my career working part-time, which I never would have chosen. And, you know, while I'm grateful to still have a job, I have a lot of sadness. I have financial sadness. I have sadness that I'm not in the operating room more. And I have sadness about not being the kind of partner that I was at the beginning of my career, which was like, I used to say yes to everything and pick up all those extra shifts. And now I'm not able to do so. And my partners have had to really bail me out a million times in the last 18 months. And it it just makes me, there's a lot of sadness there that I just kind of have to name. And so I would say, I think it's really normal. And if you're feeling that, I'll just say, you're not alone. I feel it too, you know? And I try to remember, it might not always be like this, you know, it might look very different um, in a year. And then there's just some things around work issues, which I wanted to mention. So I was um, on short-term disability for five months after Brandon died, but I, as a trauma surgeon, I'm like stuck caring for people with head injuries and suicide victims, I mean, to be honest. And at the beginning, even reading our sign out was so triggering. And so I, that was where therapy was very, very helpful. My therapist had me read the sign out twice a day. He's like, if you want to go back to work, you have to do the work. And I felt very strongly that I had invested so many years into training that I did want to go back to work. Um, but I'm really, Brandon was a patient at my hospital. So there's signs of him everywhere. And so I'm just really kind with myself. Sometimes I'll just sit in a chair that I know he sat in and just like have a cry for a minute. But I'm also really um, put a lot of effort into kind of trying to leave my stuff at the door and like try to be the best doctor I can be. And then I've had to really fight against catastrophizing. So at the beginning, when I'd see head injury patients, I'm like, oh my God, they're all gonna die. Well, you know, my partner reminds me what happens to what happened to Brandon is one in a million, and that all these patients are individuals. And I just need to constantly remind myself of that. Um, and I also found that my boundaries got a little uh, lacks. Like when I would see these patients, I really, oh, well, I just went through this too. And, and the way I ended up channeling that was, you know, instead of saying, oh, my boyfriend committed suicide. Now I'm like, you know, I've been in your shoes and do you mind if I print off some, um, information that really helped me? Or when I see a head injury, I'm like, I can tell them, oh my God, this is the best vestibular therapist in town. And so I've tried to really work to channel it into something that still allows me to honor my experience and what Brandon taught me, but also like be a good doctor and a good surgeon. So that's a lot. I just want to say also, if anyone's going through something similar, I do um, have the benefit now of having some time and, and just some bandwidth in my life. So if anyone ever needs to talk, I can totally, I, I do have the bandwidth to listen because I get how painful it is to be in the midst of it. That's all for me right now. Thank you. That was an awful lot. So (laughs) I will just say with all of the respect due to all the work that you've done, Dr. Hoffman, and with respect to the fact that you've just shared really personal and amazing things about yourself, I will say, Red, thank you. Thank you for sharing your truth and thank you for sharing your vulnerability. And thank you for being willing to articulate things that most of us still have a really hard time saying out loud. I cannot possibly thank you enough from the bottom of my heart for sharing your story. I appreciate you. Thanks so much. So though that's a tough act to follow, um, but you guys, we have such an amazing panel today. And I am just so thrilled to introduce Dr. Rohan Jayaraja. Dr. Jayaraja is the director of GI Surgical Service, as well as the program director for the Hepatobiliary and Advanced GI Surgery Fellowship Programs at Methodist Richardson Medical Center. He also serves as the chair of the Department of Surgery at the TCU and UNTHSC School of Medicine. Dr. Jayaraja is the secretary for the America's Hepatobiliary Association and the former president of the Fellowship Council and past chair of the HPV Program Directors Committee for the America's Hepatobiliary Association. He is, has authored numerous articles and book chapters and serves on several committees, both locally and nationally, trained at the University of Chicago and attended a liver transplant fellowship at Baylor, served on the faculty at UT Southwestern Medical School, where he ran, rose to the rank of associate professor, and is somebody that we think of as a 
transparent, stylish example of how to be an amazing hepatobiliary surgeon. Dr. Jayaraja, you have the floor. Wow, with that introduction, I'm so humbled. And I just want to echo Dr. Hack's uh, comments about what you said, Dr. Hoffman, and what you shared with us. You helped me so much through uh, listening to your story and what you've been through. And you just give me faith in humanity. And I just want you to know that. Uh, it makes me so proud to say that I am part of the profession that you're, you're part of. And so thank you for, for that. With that being said, I feel even more inadequate than I did before to, to share my humble experience uh, with this group. But to say I don't teach yoga, but I practice yoga. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually fairly flexible for a 57 year old Sri Lankan guy. So, so good for that. And yoga has been really important to me from a self care perspective. I did want to say that when I was leading a panel with the ACS looking at uh, wellness and leaders, the one common theme across all leaders was that they took time out to exercise or do something. And the one tip that I got from somebody that was fantastic was she said, even if it's just one minute, it should be every day. And that was really lovely to hear because sometimes the surgeons, you know, we have to run the marathon, right? We can't just walk down the block. But as Dr. Hoffman said, sometimes after long COVID, walking down the block, is the challenge, right? And so just making it that block and a half is our next goal. So I wanted to sort of divide this up into three different areas of kind of personal areas, work, and then talk about a little bit about faith. And so I, um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about my personal life. So I'm from Sri Lanka, grew up in Africa, went to school in England and came to the US for undergraduate medical school. I call it the great move west like John Steinbeck. And I think to start out with, I feel like an imposter all the time. Um, I think that one of the hardest things for me was, you know, I was fortunate enough to match at the University of Chicago and having a foreign passport that was a huge challenge just to match. And so my heart always goes up and I really empathize with everyone that's struggling. Every time we have a rank list for our match and everything, I'm always like, that person has shown me their, how great they are, how they've overcome things. So from a personal standpoint, I enter a room feeling kind of unworthy and that's always hard. I mean, I started this panel by talking to my panelists about feeling unworthy to be here because they were just amid such amazing folks. And so I think one of the things that we have to realize is that uh, I think humility is a good place to start from, but I think that sometimes holding yourself um, to a standard that you never feel that you can reach is not a good place to start from, from a personal health standpoint. And so for me, that was when I was at UT and then left, I felt that that was kind of the end of my life. I wasn't in academic medicine and I wasn't fulfilling all of those things that I wanted, just like Dr. Hoffman said, from a, from a professional standpoint. And so we kind of have to maneuver. And so the first lesson for me is always that you should never do anything career-wise for somebody else. You should always come to that decision yourself. So sure, I'm pretty sure that my wife would have been thrilled for me not to have even pursued a transplant career. But when I didn't finish the second year of transplant and decided to take a job in general surgery at, at UT Southwestern, that was my decision. I didn't do that because she wanted me to. It would, uh, she would have felt horrible if I had changed my career plans for her. And I think it shows up somewhere else in your life if you do things for others without you truly wanting it. And so for us, after I left UT, we wanted to stay in Dallas. I wanted to stay in Dallas for my family. And so it was important that I leave academic medicine and that was okay because that's what I wanted for the family. So breaking it into three categories, you know, as a husband, when we first got married, I was in a really crazy residency, right? Uh, you know, no ATR work week. I was uh, in the lab. I, I then went into the lab, which was great, which I call time getting to know my wife. But it, it, as you all know, it's such a challenge, right? To be present when you're home and not think about what's going on at work or what's going on in the lab. 
and to be fully present. So for me, you know, one of the easy things in the early days was I didn't have a computer at home. It was great. And I, it was only till about 10 years ago that I actually did, brought a laptop home because it was a way that I could separate work. And I always tell our trainees, you know, be present for your uh, significant others because the worst thing is to be partially present, right? And so, you know, I found that actually separating that and taking 30 minutes at work to finish my charts or whatever was the best way for me to be present and actually look at my wife in the eye and be fully present for her. I have to say phones has really made that difficult. And I was just talking to my wife about how I really wish I could, um, you know, just silence my phone. The problem is that I'm sort of always having to be available for referrals and that gets challenging, but I really need to find a way to do that because I feel like with my phone, I'm not as present as I was before, before we were so connected. Um, as a father, so, I, you know, anyone that has kids, I was just saying that I think we need lessons on how to raise kids because we had no idea what to do with, uh, with our kids. And we had a very challenging uh, set of circumstances. You know, I won't get into it too much, but just to state that we had some issues with one of my kids that was, you know, really, really challenging. Um, we had several things all happen at once. We had a family member that was diagnosed with breast cancer. He took a real nosedive on a um, bad friends, you know, got into some stuff and it all kind of came together as a head. And, and I, you know, I'm just trained in this generation where I, I went to the hospital and I went into round. Like I saw him and then I went to my hospital and rounded. And it was just like, that's what I have to do because I have to be strong. And we don't, it, it, it's okay to grieve. The people around you want to help you. And again, I think of my generation, especially it was such a sign of weakness that you took any time off. And I'm really having to retrain myself constantly because I struggle with this. You know, we're even reaching this at this point where the kids have left the house. And, you know, my wife is just this incredibly, wonderfully supportive human being that you just meet her once and you know she's just spiritually like right here. It's like, you know, it's like, at the end of yoga where you just have that feeling of complete peace. And that's where, you know, she is. She you just meet her once. And, you know, she's, she's home now with the dogs. There are no kids. And I need to be there for her. And it's really like, I have to figure out how to make this work in my mind that not saying yes to everything is okay. Um, but like Dr. Hoffman said, you know, we're so wired to, con because we've given our lives to medicine, right, to sort of, uh, to sort of make this our success being, uh, being, being our jobs. So I do want to sort of wrap up, you know, with our, as a son is my last job, right, because my two siblings live in the UK, and I've been the main caretaker for our parents, and so we've always kind of moved, or they've moved close to us, etc. Wow, again, coming from a pretty traditional Sri Lankan household, where, like, we were supposed to have our parents live with us when they got older, that was such a disappointment in every way, right? And I think to some degree it was to my parents too, you know, especially when we moved into a nice house, I think in some place my mom was like, oh, we're coming to live with you, right? And I know that that was not right. Like that couldn't be right. I was not enough present for my family already. So I, it was too much. And my family, my wife, my kids needed to come first. And I know my parents wanted that for me. They wanted that. It was just hard to, hard to accept it. So we did what we could. We did assisted living. We did everything that we could. I got caregivers in, as Dr. Hoffman said, please pay for the things that you don't have to do. So we found a cleaner that would do laundry. You know, I mean, we paid extra for it, but do it, like do it. If, you know, if you've got young kids, please go out once a week for a date. 
or even if you don't have kids or, or what, you know, just, just go out once a week where you and put your phones away and you're sitting opposite each other and you're not texting each other over dinner, but looking at each other and just take that time. Because especially from a family standpoint, there's a time when those kids are gone and those parents are gone and you're looking at each other and you still wanna make sure that the spark is still there. And my wife has been so great about that. It's been amazing. And then my last thing is, especially to the trainees in the audience, at the end of all of this, you are going to have some time and you don't want to be just a surgeon. So to me, it's we go to the symphony, I play the piano, I bake eclairs. I love this kind of stuff. It brings me so much joy to do all of this stuff. So just keep up at least one uh, trait. And I would really encourage exercise as somebody who's totally uncoordinated with any sort of coordinated activity probably not a good thing to say as a surgeon but uh but i'm i i exercise more than anyone i went to high school with and i'm not rocking the dad body so <laughs> thank you on that note i'm gonna wrap up i'm willing to bet your hand eye coordination is solid so we're gonna we're gonna go with that thank you so much for sharing your experience and Thank you to both of you for, for sharing your experiences and your vulnerability. So trust is built on shared vulnerability and sharing our vulnerability is something that we are indoctrinated to have a really difficult time with in surgery because we have to be confident and we have to project our confidence and that can become a double-edged sword because we don't wanna be always confident and occasionally correct. So how do we share our concerns and our fears which are legitimate and essential while wrestling with that perception of the surgeon as infallible. So thank you both for leading by example. I have so many questions and I'm sure that a lot of the folks in the audience have them as well. I would like to start with a very practical and pragmatic question, but first I would also like to thank both of you for sharing your your truth and your experiences being so different i think is really valuable so to dr jayaraja's imposter syndrome i would say we all could do ourselves a favor and unpack that from our suitcase because we all got to where we are the hard way we didn't cut corners we showed up we did the work and we experienced our lives with all the gory details and it's valid and it's important and we don't know what part of our experience is going to help somebody else. So I just want to thank both of you for being so transparent and being willing to share your truth. So on a, on a more practical note uh, to Dr. Hoffman, I think um, we've all sort of had the experience of trying to wrestle with ourselves to fit the system. And sometimes we'll do that to a point and it's not enough. And then we have to figure out how it is that we may change our relationship with our system to make things sustainable and or feasible. So you spoke a little bit about going part-time, you spoke about short-term disability, you spoke about what it looks like now. Can you talk about that conversation with your organization? Because I think that that's probably one that most of us are not familiar with or comfortable with. Sure, you, I always think, I, I find it so interesting. This all happened when I was 47 years old and I think back and I think, God, it, it took all this tragedy for me to really have enough, um, courage to really just ask for what I need. To be honest with you, the reality was there was nothing else I could do. I was so pushed up against the wall, one with Brandon's illness. But then once I got long COVID, it pushed me so far up against the wall that I'm like, all I can offer you if you want me is 50%. Um, and, and then I've been able to do some administrative work to make up for some of that. But it was just, that's literally all I can give you. And so it's weird that I never would have had the courage to do that before, but I was just really upfront about it too. Like I, I tried to be very proactive right from the beginning um, when Brandon was injured. Like I can tell, I could tell very quickly this, I was not going to be able to do everything and I was just going to end up disappointing people. So I'm like, I'd rather set reasonable expectations up front. And then I, again, I had to do it after I got sick. And you know, I realize that not every organization is kind of built in the same way. I happen to be at a place where they could accommodate me and I'm very grateful. I will say, I think I built a lot of social capital over the years. I've done a lot of, a lot of free work. And even when I was on short-term disability, I did a lot of 
administrative work they weren't able to pay me for and thinking like i'm just putting good stuff in the bank like they help me i'm going to help them and they're going to help me again and so that's kind of how it i i think um you never know what's going to happen so i was always kind of planning i must have been planning ahead <laughs> That's that's incredibly helpful to understand. Thank you for sharing that. I think we we are sort of so conditioned to be self-contained and self-sufficient and not admit weakness that sort of the unknown of how are they going to respond if I go tell them you can get me for this much. I think is is very helpful to sort of say, well, you don't know till yet till you say it. And we might just be surprised by how much our organization does value us because sometimes they will take us for what we can give. Yep. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. A question came in through the chat that I'm going to ask both of you um, uh, to speak to. And the question is, do you have any advice on dealing with complication and second victim syndrome as it relates to caring for yourself, your family and friends, and then continuing to care for your patients? Mm. So Dr. Hoffman, you're off mute currently. If, and then Dr. Jayaraja, we'd love to hear from you next if you've got words. Um, oh God, that second victim syndrome is so real. I mean, I was experiencing it before all this happened. I, I just can't say enough about therapy. I want it, you know, there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which is a very trauma informed book that really I think is great for people who have a little education. So I think it's great for this group. The first is like the first part of it is very much about what's happening when you're experiencing these traumas. And the whole second part of the book is all these different therapies that really are trauma-informed therapies, EMDR, internal family system, somatic therapy. One of them will resonate with yoga. One of them will resonate with you. It's like, there's no, you can't talk yourself out of this stuff. You know, for me, I did a lot of, I had to do a really intense exposure therapy to kind of get over this trauma of witnessing the suicide. But it's like, we have to do this work for ourselves. And then I think for our partners, um, and then for our patients, because we, we all want to do a good job. That's why we're here, but it's hard to do that work when you're already traumatized. It's hard, like I said, not to catastrophize. So I would just say like, you're so worth it. And like, if you're not, if you can't do it for yourself, then do it for your patients. Cause they're worth it too. They deserve the best of you. And like, again, you don't have to wait for a tragedy to strike to find time. You have to just do, like, I need this. I'm doing this. I'm going to say no to the five other things I've said yes to that I really don't need to do. And I'm going to do this work instead, whatever it looks like for you. Um, Dr. Hack, I wanted to take a slightly different turn on this question, which is second victim syndrome from the standpoint of dealing with a patient outcome. Um, and I think this is really important because I think everyone faces this and we don't, we don't face this, right? So when we have a patient death or an unexpected event, um, we are the second victim in, in those cases. And we really don't acknowledge this at all. We expect it to go back to work the next day. And the way I sort of take that on is at m, &M I, every one of our trainees will tell you, I'm the first to say, this is on me. This is not on you. You are my trainee. This is on me. And the second part is, what can I do differently next time to make this better, right? But I was crying at the sink after one of these incidences where I had a patient die after an ileostomy takedown of C. diff colitis. I, 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 I had no idea what was happening. This is a straightforward operation. I assumed it was me, right? I assumed she leaked. I assumed it was all in my hands. And then I just kind of wanted to talk just for two seconds about faith here, because I do think that believing in something greater than you, me, or, you know, and whether that be, you know, God, he, he she, or the tree, that we should look to a greater power. And there's a greater path than just us, right? I always say that surgeons come in two flavors, either they think they're God, or they believe in God. And again, him, her, or the tree, it doesn't, it can be a greater power of any kind. But every recovery program does invoke spirituality, right, Dr. Hoffman, every recovery program. And so I do think it would be silly of us not to at least acknowledge that. I appreciate both of those answers, because they sort of address um, 
different parts of the emotional cocktail and the societal milieu that we all sort of bask in when these things happen. I will add another element of that, which is the system that we work within, right? So when there's a bad outcome, there's a root cause analysis and there's an investigation. And most and those things are necessary and important, but very rarely do they stop to take into account the feelings of the people that are being investigated. And to that point, I think there's probably opportunity for us to join the conversation of how it is that we conduct those analyses and those investigations to really make sure that we're honoring fair and just culture, to really make sure that we're honoring that life that was lost or that complication that occurred and the, the way that it affected all of the people around it. So I think that creating a more supportive, less punitive healthcare system really needs all of these voices to be heard. Dr. Hoffman's, Dr. Jaya Raja's, and everybody on this call, because we're all going to be that second victim at some point, and we probably have a right to speak to how we want to be treated in that experience, because at some point it's gonna be one of our trainees, it's gonna be one of our best friends, it's gonna be us again. And we want to be fair to that patient and that family and own it, Dr. Jayaraja, I agree with you. I was taught to prepare for m, &M by finding the sharpest sword, taking a running start and throwing myself at it as hard as I possibly could, which is really, really helpful to help develop accountability and take ownership for the things that I can do better next time. But it is a double-edged sword. And I think we all need to recognize when it is that that accountability crosses that inflection point of not helping us be better tomorrow, but keeping us up at night and having us show up as not the best version of ourselves tomorrow, because I'm still beating myself up over yesterday. And I think that that's all, all of those things are a part of, of hopefully what will become a, a, a better response going forward so that we support our victims as opposed to creating more of them. And Dr. Hack, if I could just pull that thread a little bit further, because I really think if uh, if Kathleen and Jenny could use this as a bullet point, maybe that would be one thing that could come out of this group is actually a, um, a way to deal with root cause analysis, taking the surgeon into, into, into account. That could be something that the ACS could help with. I did want to say that that, that sense of you know exactly what you said about accountability so i just want to share a story because i was i was sitting in um in the uh, surgeon's lounge when i was young faculty at a major institution and there were many patients that didn't want me to be succeeding in this specific area because it was competition for them we all know this right from what we work in and I had done a Whipple and she was bleeding and I was, she was an IR undergoing embolization. And I was, not only was the issues of the patient, which was my main concern, but of all the ramifications from everyone around me, like he'll never do a Whipple again, we're just waiting for him to fail, blah, 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 which happens so often, unfortunately, especially with young trainees or young faculty. And I remember sitting there praying, saying, Lord, why is this happening to me? And I had a very clear answer, which is, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about the patient. And my wife can tell you, like, that day, the next day, I was a better husband, a better father, because I was able to say, done my job. I've done everything I can. There's no more I can do that is going to be helpful by worrying, because that's all I was doing, was worrying and wringing my hands. And so it really helped me just relieve some of that to, again, whatever you call him, her, or the tree, just, uh, you know, and, and Red, I'd love for you to maybe just comment on that. Well, it's bringing up for me, it's something I thought a lot about when Brandon died, uh, especially because I'm a trauma surgeon and I'm like, oh my God, my traumatically injured boyfriend, like literally died on my watch. But something I used to think all, I think all the time about when as a surgeon is what happens when your very best isn't good enough, whatever that means. We do our very best and our patient has a complication. We do our very best and our patient dies. We do our very best and our boyfriend kills himself in the backyard. What happens? You know, for me, I, I just appreciate that idea. I mean, I think my spiritual life is like so much richer this past year. And again, not by choice, right? I mean, well, I guess I could choose to either go deep down into that hole or I'm going to, I'm just going to like open my heart up to this mess that's in front of me and like try to find some sort of 
um, meaning and, and solace in it. And that's what I've done. And that's certainly whatever that looks like for you. I don't, I, I love that he, she, or the tree. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, but it's really, I've like, I've said in the last year, I feel more like myself than I felt since I started medical school. Like, and that's been, um, lovely. And I would say to everyone listening, like my question always is like, why does, why do you have to wait till tragedy to get you there? You know, is there a way to integrate, especially like to the trainees, like, is there a way to kind of try to integrate a little of this juiciness into your life before it all goes to hell, you know? Oh my gosh. So much that can be said. I think this is such an important discussion. And I, I think the last, there are some really great questions in the chat that I want us to go to, but I want to just respect and receive and honor what both of you have said. And I would just encourage all of us to think through when a colleague has a complication. Because because saying some of the things that we've just shared with each other to that person when they're sitting there wringing their hands can make such a huge difference and can be so powerful in making you feel like you belong and you're not alone and you're not the only one that's had a complication and there's going to be more and we've all been there and we were here with you. I think that can really, really change those feelings of isolation that we feel when we're at M&M and it's our complication and we feel all of the bad things that are associated with feeling like we're not good enough and like we're an imposter and like we've done harm. And those feelings are important to recognize and name and scrutinize and live with a little bit, but also to let go when they're no longer serving us. And I think that sometimes a good friend can be really, really helpful in that capacity. So I just want to thank both of you for being that kind of person and surgeon and friend. Um, there are two questions that I'm going to tie together a little bit because I think they're, they're related and, and I'd love both of you to address them. The first one is, could you comment on the need to separate being a physician and being a spouse or parent facing life-threatening illness? And I'm going to throw that out there. And I just want to add the second part on because before I forget. And what if that sick loved one is counting on you and is across the country and you're mid-training or young faculty and just starting out? So um, I'll throw those two questions out there and see what you want to do with those, because those are big ones to unpack. So I'll go first, uh, Dr. Hoffman, if that's okay. Um, so I guess let me give you my life example. So I think my mom would be okay with this, with me sharing. She suffered from severe depression. And, uh, you know, when they moved to America, um, I was in the midst of training. And we just had a baby and they were living. And I thought this was the best thing in the world that they would both be living upstairs from us in a high rise apartment, not thinking at all about my poor wife, right? Who now had both of my parents coming down and a new baby asking what's for lunch. And so again, cultural, right? A lot of cultural you know, differences, right? And so that was really hard. And so I just fast forward, they moved to Austin and, you know, my mom was struggling a lot at that point with her mind. And I, I struggled. I was at UT Southwestern. I was, you know, trying to do everything I needed to do over there. I, I was basically had a basic science lab that was there from six to nine at night because I thought you had to be the triple threat and I was doing all the clinical work. I was on trauma call, even though I was mainly doing HPV and stuff. And, you know, I, I just, it was a lot. And then trying to be present for my family on the weekends. Um, <clears throat> I think you do what you can do. I think you get as much resources as you can. We didn't have much money at the time, but I think paying for as much resources as possible is always helpful. So when they did move to Dallas, I paid for care for people to go out, take them out, take them to the movies, uh, do those type of things, you know, go to doctor's appointments, et cetera. I think that meals and really actually getting food to the person that you're caring from can be really meaningful too. And then I think, you know, you've got to protect your own mental health. And so you've got to do what you can and keep it as, you know, keep that time as meaningful as possible. So even though they're short trips, 
making them as meaningful as possible. Fast forward to now, my mom is in a nursing facility. It's on my way home from work. Every day I see that exit, I think I should stop, but I'm balancing that, right? My wife's at home. You know, we've got kids I've got to communicate with. How do you do that all? So we've agreed on once a week on a Sunday, I'll take her out for lunch. And she's really good with that. I think it's setting expectations, but also meeting them and being realistic. Dr. Hoffman? Uh, I feel like I, I so failed at this, it's hard to answer. But I, you know, one of the things I had written about this, and I remember writing that, you know, um, I used to like go to work to like escape from home. And then I used to come home to escape from work. And when you're caring for someone ill, there's like no escape, you know, work reminds you of home, home reminds you of work. It's just illness, suffering, sad, stress um, constantly. I mean, some of the things I wrote down and these are hard truths, like, unfortunately, um, this is not the time that like you're going to save money. This is the time you're going to spend money because I agree that anything that you can um, pay for to have someone else do, I would just do it. You know, 10,000 extra dollars that you spend this year is not going to, it's, I mean, I can't say that to everyone, but I could, I think to this group, I could probably say that it's not going to make you or break you and it might save some of your sanity. And it might not be a time that you're going to be able to advance in your career. And that's, again, coming back to that grief and that sadness, but like cutting myself some slack there, like just gave me space to breathe so that like my parasympathetic nervous system could like get some like traction in my body. Um, at the beginning, I was still trying to do everything. And I'm like, I just can't do it anymore. I mean, does it matter if I'm not on some national committee for a year or two? It is what it is, you know, um, especially for people who are caring for people where time is short. I mean, time is short. So I would just say, like, now's the time to spend that time with that person. And your career, trust me, your career will be there. The, it, it just will, you know. Um, but again, I'm saying that as someone who didn't do I didn't do the I didn't do the best job at it. I think it's it's kind of like when you can't escape, when it's just in your face 24 hours a day, it is really a, really a struggle. So then it comes back to asking like, you know, is there a way to work less? Because we only have 24 hours a day and you have to sleep. With all due respect, Dr. Hoffman, I respectfully disagree with your assessment of having <laughs> failed. <laughs> well. I, and actually, there's a comment in the chat that speaks to it, which I think is really important. Um, and the comment, it says, this correlates with discussions with cancer patients. They've done everything we've asked and the cancer still, quote, wins. It isn't that the patient failed treatment. We can do our best and still have bad outcomes, not failures. Yeah. And I think that it's self-compassion is the hardest type to practice sometimes when you're used to turning it outwards a lot of the time. And I think that... Um, I would respectfully say that one of the harder things about separating being a surgeon from being a caregiver, and one of the hard things just in general, is that we have a lot less control over things than we would like to think. We, yes. are, we, we are trained to have control over a lot of things that most of the people don't have control over, and that's dangerous because then we get sort of fall into the trap of thinking we have control over stuff we really don't have control over. And it's even worse when you're in the family member role and you're not even writing the orders for care. And so I, I would just ask all of us, and I'll remind us now, and somebody's gonna have to remind me in five minutes, but we can give our best. And, that, and if we don't get the outcome that we want, it doesn't mean that we have failed. Yeah. And I just wanna make sure that, that we, that we put that cushion around ourselves because we can be really, really hard on ourselves. And that can actually be really damaging in the long run. Um, because if we show up for everybody else, but tell ourselves continuously how poorly we are performing over, over a period of time, that, that takes a toll. That takes a toll. And I just want to say thank you for showing up. You are not a failure in my book in any way, shape, or form, or in any capacity. Um, and I just, I think that needs to be said ex really explicitly. Um, Apparently I need a little more therapy if I'm talking like this. <laughs> you know what we all do. Yeah, no, it's when very, are we I, done? 
Yeah, I think it really does speak to about being a surgeon and a caregiver is I am very used to like controlling everything and making sure everything gets done in the hospital. And when you were in that caregiver role, one, the pathology may be totally out of your control. And two, you're not, you're not running the ship. And I certainly tried to run the ship and I couldn't, I couldn't run it anyway. And so I think that is for people who have those, I mean, con control issues, or that's part of our job is to make sure things are getting done. It is a, it's very painful. Uh, Dr. Hack, I just wanted to pull that thread just a little bit further on the cancer side, because this is kind of, I'm a little bit more holistic in the way I approach my cancer patients. Surgery doesn't need to be the answer for patients, that even if they are resectable. And so for me, I think part of this also that helps me in identifying success or minimizing blame for me on myself, who obviously that's what we're trained to do, is or responsibility is... Um, in it is aligning um, goals, right? And I'm sure Dr. Hoffman knows more about this than anyone, but especially in hospice, you know, I'm amazed at the number of patients that come in to see me that are, have unresectable, un incurable disease. And nobody has talked to them about not doing chemotherapy. And nobody has talked to them about what it's gonna feel like to die and what that process is gonna look like and what will happen as time goes on and what can we do with each of these steps. And so to me, even though you may have had a successful surgery and that may be deemed success, the, the fact that we haven't cured the patient, but we've had a, a treatment plan and a goal that we've come to together is success for me. And so it's helped me a little bit in, in trying to, you know, get through the trauma and, and really, you know, the little t trauma of uh, of this Dr. Hoffman and I, little t, right? This is a big therapy word. So, um, so uh, I just wanted to, to put that out there in response to one of the questions. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, again, I, I, I cannot stress the value of the candor with which you both speak and the vulnerability that you're both willing to demonstrate because that, Again, we are expected to portray a certain image, which is just not realistic. And the more we try to cling to that, and the more desperate our attempt will become, and that will ultimately result in hurting people. Um, so I want to ask this other question that's been placed in the chat, which comes back to touch on a subject that we briefly discussed earlier. Do the panelists believe that specialized predetermined therapy, educational intervention would lessen the effect of the second victim syndrome? Dr. Hoffman, I'm gonna to defer to you for that because I'm wondering if there would be, I, I, I do think that addressing this as an entity is important, right? And so Dr. Hoffman, would there be predetermined therapeutic intervention that might help? I'm not really sure what we mean by predetermined, I guess. Um, Maybe it's just the concept of wellness, right? And yeah. the concept of self-care that is uh, something that we could talk about. But I think we could start by looking at second victim as bad outcomes for your patients or un, undesirable outcomes is what I should say. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, one of the ways that I like to combine my role as like a palliative care doctor and a surgeon is I do a lot of mortality work for my hospital. So a lot of surgical complications and deaths kind of come across my desk. And then I have an opportunity to um, speak with the surgeons about it, or maybe their, their patients end up in the neurotrauma ICU where I work. And I always take a lot of time to just like sit, I'll just like take the surgeon aside and just kind of have a little coffee chat about like, Hey, how are you? Like I've been there. And do you, do you need a moment and really give them that space? And that maybe because sometimes it's hard when it's like in your same field. So I'm like, all right, I'm a surgeon. I've been there, but um, you know, recently at, at someone it was an, or it was an ortho procedure gone way bad. I don't do those procedures, but I spent, you know, and I called the guy on the phone and we just chatted, you know, and I could tell he was really right struggling in a way that it wasn't even, again, I wouldn't have even thought it was his fault. It was just, it just happened, you know? Um, so I do think kind of leaving, 
kind of taking the time and leaving space for our colleagues to have those conversations. And certainly, you know, some of us see more of those complications. As someone who works in the ICU, I actually see a lot of the complications in a way that maybe some of these people's partners are not seeing. So I do really, I always just say, and this is not just to me, I tell my trainees, because they like, you know, sometimes they think they're you know, sometimes when you're learning, you think you're a little better than maybe you are. It hasn't happened to you yet there. And I just always say there, but for the grace of God, go I, we will all be there. And so I just like to remind everyone, you know, like if you operate enough, this is going to happen and that's okay. We just need to talk about it. So I think there is a real role in us um, supporting one another and normalizing, like you said, crying at the sink. I mean, how could you not cry when something like that happens? You know, it's just a matter of crying, you know, not over the patient in the operating room, but like taking a moment and crying and, and, um, and still being able to do your job and finding that balance. We are, this, these are, these are such an amazing discussion points. I want to add that I think, um, I agree with everything that has been said. And I will just add that I think the prior education in anticipation of the fact that we're going to be there at some point is valuable, very important and necessary, probably not going to save us from the emotional hijacking that's going to associate the company, the event regardless. And so to that point, it's probably good to tell people it's going to happen, show up to support them when it happens and give the space and give all of the things that have been discussed and then also have a compassionate considerate, but systematic, methodical, and reliable root cause analysis process. I think all of those things are probably related. And I do want to make sure that we get to ask the last question, because I think there's this is probably a good one to add to end on, and I'll, I have my opinion. But the last question says, um, uh, DOT following major surgery is very traumatic and depressing, more so when this is due to medical error. How does one handle the emotional trauma in settings where there is no support or help? And before I turn this over to Drs. Hoffman and Jay Raja, I, I would just say that the conversation we have just had makes me want to say that help may come from the places you are not expecting it to come from. Don't think that because there isn't a program that says help for surgeons that just had a difficult outcome at your organization, that there aren't lots and lots of people around that care about you, that want to show up for you, that want to be helpful. And I would just say, don't be afraid to share your truth, talk to your colleagues and ask for help. But I, I'm not on the panel, so I want to just stop it and turn it over to the panelists as we wrap up. Well, this reminds me a lot of my feelings around mentorship, which is you might, um, I've learned in residency, the, you know, a lot of the mentorship I needed wasn't there. So I found it through ACS and East and different places. And I'd say the same for this. Like, I would just say like, my email is always open to just, to just listen and to say like, yes, I have been there. And it is terrifying on many levels. There's the grief around making a mistake. There's the grief around causing harm. There's the fear around being sued. There's the fear around losing your credentials. Like we have to name all of it. Also, I'd say speaking with someone who's gone through it, because for me as a younger surgeon, I didn't even understand when I came in, what is a credential committee? I didn't learn that in residence. You don't even know who's watching you, you know? So now I've learned, oh, I'm kind of learning how the hospital works. Now I'm on the peer review committee. Now I'm part of it. So I understand. So that's another way I think we can control this whole, not control, but make a difference in this situation is get onto those leadership positions and bring this like love and this kind of maybe a little bit of a different view into things. And then we can kind of like infect the whole hospital system with it. But you got to be at the table to do some of that. But again, I just want to say like, if you, if that person needs a chat, like I'm so here, I've so been there. I, I want to echo, echo, echo that. I sometimes think that going outside your own institution is the most helpful because yeah. there's just so much going on locally that I don't even know about. <clears throat> some of that is financial. Some of that is interpersonal. You know, somebody once told me that in academic medicine, the knives are stabbed in your back based on power struggles, whereas in private practice, it's more about where the money stream is. So you're going to get attacked 
if you're affecting one of those things. Uh, one of the things that I would love the ACS to take on, Kathleen and Jenny, is <laughs> centralized peer review, because I actually think it is impossible for there to be non-biased peer review, especially in some of the smaller hospitals in the country, or when there are departments that are fighting with each other over certain case, you know, kind of things. It's, it's really impossible. But like Dr. Hoffman, and I'm gonna speak for Dr. Hack, the three of us are totally available. Find me and Dr. Hoffman on Twitter, not Dr. Hack, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you can always... <laughs> You could always reach out or reach out to Jenny or Kathleen too, because, you know, I think that this would actually be another thing for the ACS to do would be to have a centralized repository of resources. And sometimes, you know, I mean, I just have to tell you the thing that helped me the most when I tore a portal vein into doing a Whipple was I could not get back on, like, I couldn't face that operation. Mm -hmm. And my partner, who was a colorectal surgeon at the time, said to me, Rohan, I would have you operate on me any day. And I remember that because whenever somebody comes to me and says, I just don't know if I can continue, uh, I tell them that if I believe it. I'm not just going to say that if I believe it, because I really feel like that as a surgeon is your greatest validation, right? Is family members and for me when our nursing staff and OR staff send their families to me more than the Queen of England that is my greatest validation that I am doing an okay job. Amen to that. I think we'll we will let it be there. We are here for all of you if if we can be resources or be support for you in any way shape or form. Thank you all so much for being here today but thank you for being who you are and doing what you do.